today I'm gonna have a speech at my former university. Sehr, sehr stark, no joke. Wichtige Message auf jeden Fall dahinter gewesen. Hey, mega nice, mega inspirierend. Immer wieder spannend äh, und immer wieder konzentriert zuhören, weil man kann sehr, sehr viel lernen. Ich denke, dass die Jungs und die Mädels, die dort waren, sehr viel von ihnen lernen können. Da kann sich jeder Student und jeder, der Unternehmer werden will, eine Scheibe abschneiden. A big round of applause for these guys who've organized this. Thank you so much. So, um, it feels so great because you know what we've gone through in the past two years to see people again in these masses. So, I think it's the light, end of the tunnel, the light we are seeing, so it makes me happy. Generally, I believe you are in a beautiful place. Not only because of the nature around here, because you are either studying here or planning to study here or you should be studying here because this is a place which really makes great people. And that is not because what you're learning here, that is obviously part of it, but because who you're meeting, you're meeting really great people and they stick with you for the rest of your lives. Having said that, um, I haven't really prepared a detailed presentation because I want to leave some room for us to discuss, but also because I've written a book and if I start talking, I never stop. So I said, give me six, seven key words and I'll talk about that. Um, and what I'm planning to do is I'm trying to give you a superpower today, okay? And that superpower is so nice because it helps you through the rest of your lives. Not only in business, but generally in life. And I've learned it. I've learned it over the years. And I've actually written a book because I kind of figured it out. And I want you, maybe you can take it away from me. I'm not going to teach you business today because that's going to take you probably a bit longer than 45 minutes. I'm just going to teach you about what I believe are important things in life which kind of get you where you want to be. And that is, I think, the most important thing. Imagine there's something wrong, right? Whatever it is. And you cannot fix it. That is a bad feeling. And I believe entrepreneurship is one of the ways to get there. It's not the only way. But I believe power is the ability to enforce change. I think mean, that is something you need to understand. Now, obviously, okay, who is powerful? Who is influential? Whatever does that even mean? Right? I looked into this. And then I said, okay, I think it's all about persuasion. Right? Can you persuade other people? Can you persuade yourself? So persuasion starts with yourself. Can you persuade yourself to have that standard of excellence? To have that mindset you need to whatever you need to get to. Right? That's where it starts. Because if you don't do that with yourself, you have no ability to actually have an act of persuasion onto other people. So you persuade yourself, you get that mindset. You persuade customers and you have a great business. You persuade investors and you get funding for your business. So, but persuasion, and that's what I figured out, is not necessarily based on truth, right? Who knows the difference between truth and reality? Because when you understand this, and at the end of this presentation, I hope I can give you a bit of an insight into that difference and what it actually means in business. Because there's only one truth, what we call the objective truth. It's based on logic. It's true whether you believe it or not, it's true. But there's also two types of realities which matter much more. 95% of our brains are wired towards stories. We have a hardwired affinity towards stories. If it's true or not, it has to be real. So I'm telling you this. Truth is based on the scientific process. You have a hypothesis, testable, 
experiment, you replicate it, it works, it's true. Unfortunately, that's not what the world is based on. The world is based on two other things, much more. 95% of our brains actually look at that subconsciously. And one I call media reality. That is based on excessive repetition. It doesn't matter if it's a scientific process. If you hear it so often, it could be the business's slogans, it could be media repeating things, and then it becomes something called cognitive ease. It feels true. It's real. You hear it all so often. And then there's something called individual reality. And that is interesting because individual reality is what you believe on because of who is telling it to you or what kind of emotions they appeal to. For example, I cannot convince you of my religion. You cannot convince me of your religion based on a scientific process. You need something called an act of persuasion. We had holy wars because of that. Because you cannot just say, you know what, this is the process, just replicate it yourself. If you get the same result, then you'll believe it. That's what we call individual reality. So now we know suddenly the world just, doesn't just tell you what's true. It just tells you what's useful for you. And that's what the brain is based on. So the evolution based on the process of natural selection hasn't really taught us what's true and objective reality. That's not necessarily what we need. The brain just filters on what's useful to you. Keep this in mind. Because if you really go scientific, and I had to do this for writing a book, it's not out yet, don't Google it. But at the end of the day, you will figure out colors don't exist. Odor doesn't exist. Chemical structures don't have a scent. This is what our brains are actually telling us, right? How the light is reflected into our eyes, what we interpret it. We all agree because we use the same devices. But if a cat looks at something, they see other colors. So think about it. I don't want to kind of remove the foundation of your beliefs and say, oh, nothing is true. Well, the true things are consistent. Truth is consistency. Because media realities can change. Individual realities can change. But you will need to understand this because that's what most businesses are exploiting. And it's not necessarily bad, it's competition. The ones who do that best, they actually can control your opinions. And I'm going to tell you something at the end of this presentation, which is going to make sure that you are not believing everything you think. Okay? Try to understand the difference between what you believe and what you think. Because as soon as you identify your thoughts with yourself, you might create something called an in-group and an out-group. I believe in this, they don't. They are different. That can lead to something called infrahumanization, which is bad, because it can lead to very radical splits in society. Now, so what I did is I actually said, okay, we talked about power, we talked about influence. I said, who were the most powerful influential people in history? Yes, I researched that. And I said, okay, what were these guys doing? Unfortunately, most of them were guys. This is changing nowadays, I hope. So I made a ranking. I said, oh, some kind of 41% of them were some kind of political leaders. Some of them were called emperors. Some of them were just politicians. And the other ones were scientists, 21%. 15% of the top 10 rankings mention religious leaders. And then it goes on into entrepreneurs, into philosophers, 
into a polymath, and other things. So, he said, okay, what do they have in common? If I look at this, I said, I'm not going to be the next religious leader. I think what's left, unless Jesus is somewhere, the next one is sitting here, it's very unlikely that you will have influence in this world unless you are either a politician, a scientist, or an entrepreneur. If you want to change the world with philosophy, difficult nowadays. I'm not disrespecting it, it's a beautiful science, if you want to call it. But it is not going to give you influence. So if you're talking about influence, you have three areas left. So what do they have in common? I figured out it's one common denominator. Strong financial support. That's my assumption. So I said, okay, let me become a politician. It cost me $1.6 billion today to become the US president. The ones who spent most and have the highest campaign spending are the ones winning. Except for Donald Trump, he had a lot of free media though, and the re-election campaign of Obama, which was slightly uh, less than his opponent. All the others who spent more, win. Wow. Political influence based on strong financial support. Okay, so let me become a scientist, right? doesn't have to do anything with money. And I looked at the Nobel Prize winners, ever. Where did they come from? I said, okay, the countries which spend most per capita or as a percentage of GDP, PPP, they're on the left. You don't have to read the details. And the bottom ones which spend less, they're on the right. And they win less. The more you spend in R&D, the more scientists, influential scientists you're creating. My assumptions on the line here is obvious. If you're a Nobel Prize winner, Nobel Prize laureate in science, you kind of are influential. So what is left? Entrepreneurship. You're at the right place. But, now I can tell you, maybe I'm preaching to the converted, but I can tell you, become this and you'll be successful, you'll be happy. That's not true. I'm going to tell you about a thought experiment, okay? There's a professor called Professor Nagel. So he was going to the toilet every day. And he saw in the urinal, there was a spider hanging, okay, struggling. I mean, who wouldn't? But he would just do his thing and he would always see the spider every day. And he said, man, I have to save this guy. So what he did is one day he put out the spider from there and put it on the ground and said, I saved you. Next day he came and the spider was dead. So what he thought was helping the spider, killed it. So all seeing is perspective seeing. Whatever I see comes from my frame of mind. So I might tell you, you should become an entrepreneur, it's going to help you because it worked for me, it might not work for you. That is a disclaimer. And I said, okay, I'm going to build a business. And I'm, I'm not going to talk about my biography here. I said, if you want to build a healthy company, you have to build a healthy body. And I was not like this. I almost lost 30 kilos. And I said, there's no point. I almost died from overworking. My doctor actually told me I would die in my 30s if I continue like this. And I changed my life. I used to look like this. And it's not because of the looks, don't get me wrong. It's because of the doctor told me I was only sleeping 2% of the time I was actually lying in bed. And that can kill you. 
changed my life. I said, I have that standard of excellence. So when you saw that video, which said, in my head, I'm a musician. In my head, I'm a professional athlete. That's what I had in my head. And then I was on the cover of Man's Health because I said, this is my goal. I can make it happen. So if you look at the construction site, and you see the foundation, you already know how high the building will become. Right? These are your, and health is your foundation. Otherwise, you're building a sandcastle. So I have a rule. I said, you're about to take a big decision, right? You're about to become an entrepreneur. How do you take these decisions? And I have a basic rule. I say, look, before I take a big decision, I have four steps. One, I analyze data. So what is data telling us? That gives some objectivity into it. Two, I find somebody who disagrees with me. You don't want to have yes-sayers around you. You have to find someone who disagrees. If everybody agrees, it's not a big decision. Should I love my kids? Well, everybody's going to agree. It's not a big decision. The third is I ask a woman. And because I'm not one, and I feel like they have a great sense of intuition. That helps to get some diversity in my opinions. And the last one, I have to be fast, but I always sleep over it. And you know what that could mean. Before you write that nasty email, you just don't. And 10 minutes later, you figure out, oh, good that I didn't send that. And this clarity in your mind, that comes from your sleep. So keep that as a framework for yourself before you take big decisions. These are the things I'm looking at. Data, an opponent, diversity in terms of gender, which helps me, and then also sleeping over it, but being fast. If you think about it for too long, I always say, if you actually don't know if you should do it for more than a month, you should do it because it sticks with you. But how, right? And this is where usually all your business coaches will stop and say, now you have the mindset, go ahead. But how? What's my next immediate step, right? And that's when idea evaluation, idea generation comes from. And I'm not going to talk about all of that. But I'm going to tell you what I ask the founders when I invest into them. I said, tell me one weird thing you're doing today which is going to be considered normal in five years because that's what we're investing into that's what you should live in you should live in the future because what you're building today is for your consumers in the future your team on the ground they actually should solve the problems now operationally but you should focus on the next three to five years so what weird thing are you doing today for example and uh, sell any car my company I'm doing weird things right five years ago I started YouTube vlogging today we have a content house we've created a content creation department we have a music studio we are actually creating or planning to create more viral videos because I believe anybody who's working online should have a not, I'm not talking social media community managers, it's been around for 10 years, I'm talking about being content powerhouses, creating content for the audience. I don't believe humans follow brands, they follow the people behind those brands. And the companies are going to hide just behind their logos and don't have leaders who actually go out there and show face, they will have a big disadvantage. So what weird thing are you doing today? What is going to be considered normal in five years? And two things which are really important when it comes to idea and the biggest companies in the world, they have something in common. 
One, they have very strong defensibility. Meaning they build some kind of an effect, some, for example, a network effect. They can protect their business model as soon as they grow and get to a certain inflection point. And the other thing they have is they have scalability. So, what was the first million dollar company in the world? What was the first 10 million, 100 million, billion dollar company in the world? What was the first 100 billion, trillion dollar company in the world? I looked at this. When did this happen? And then you look at the eras we went through, right? From financial institutions, and we went through transportation, steel, automotive, and we got to technology. The last three milestones were all hit by technology companies. Am I telling you you should go into tech companies? Yes, you should. Otherwise, you may, I mean, don't build a steel company. I'm not going to recommend that to you. This is what we are living in today. Look at the five biggest companies by market cap in the world. It's not coincidence. They're all tech companies. So, every year, 140 million new people are born. And we're growing by approximately 80 million people. They don't care about a fax machine, a CD, a DVD. They don't care about your black and white TVs you grew up with. You probably didn't. Not even I did. Or vinyl discs. So what I did is, to enforce that in my head, I invited kids to my office. Okay? I asked their parents, I said, bring your kids. And I went to the basement where I grew up in uh, Bremen and I pulled out a CD, pictures of my idols back then, a pager, a VHS cassette, right? A picture of Michael Jackson before and after. And a picture of Michael Jordan. I said, if they don't know this, then my world doesn't exist anymore. So I went to the children, and the children, they picked up the CD and said, oh, look, a rainbow. I said, uh, you know what that is? No. The other kid put up the VHS cassette, you know, the video cassettes. I said, you know what that is? He says, no, a box. I said, it's a movie. So he pulled it in his, on his eyes and tried to see the movie. That was it. Realize that the world is changing. And if you don't change, then your world doesn't exist anymore. So talk to children. They, your idols, their idols are different. So consider that it's coming up. So in the beginning, I actually promised you about what it means to have this difference between truth and reality and how humans actually think. So look at our brains. You think it's psychological, where everything psychological is biological. So you humans actually are summarizing the inputs from our senses to our brains. Our brains are getting 11 million sensory data points per second. You know how much we can actually process? 2 to 60 for language, motion, attention. And another 102, they we call them bits per second, for sensory processing. That's it. So all the other millions of data points the brain has just filtered out. And we work on something called an autopilot. And humans love that. I'm a human. I'm not talking like you're different. I'm just saying we love routine. We love to work on heuristics and stereotypes and assumptions because that's how we avoid decision fatigue. Imagine we would have to analyze all these bits per second, which we couldn't. 
we would overflow with information. So the brain is summarizing for us, not based on objective reality, but based on what's useful to us. So we love to wake up, go to school, go to work, come back home, eat, watch TV, sleep, repeat. That's the autopilot we work on. And the brain does that really well because it doesn't really ask for logical clarifications, attention to detail. And as soon we, as we do that, then we switch to manual mode. In very rare circumstances, when we really have to say, hold on, is this true? And suddenly we ask for objective truth. So what do companies do? The companies try to keep you on this autopilot mode. So when you have a website, you want to stick to standards. You don't want to make people think. Frictionless processes. So that's why UI and UX is important. Don't invent stuff, because people will suddenly switch to manual mode, and then they will ask for objective reality. Mm, do I really need this product? I don't think so. I can wait. But on autopilot, it's much easier to sell. So it's much easier to sell to cognitive biases than trying to fix them for consumers. So if you put out your thumb, right, like this in front, do that, please. So you will now focus on your thumb. If you see that, just look how you see your thumb. That's the only high resolution zone you have all the time. Everything else is blurry. The brain can never do a high resolution zone beyond this point. Because we, we don't need that. It's not useful for us. It's a very simple display of how much summary is happening in your brains. So, the companies try to be in that zone. Whenever you need something, they actually want to be top of mind. Repetition. That's my slogan. If you need this, I'm going to be that company. And I know you understand the power of marketing. Because you have no high resolution zone in the 360 world you live in. You only have that little thumb. That's where you need to be at. That's how you get market share. So you have probably seen this, the double kinked S curve. I don't know, if you've studied here, you probably see that a lot. It basically tells you the more, the higher the price, the less you will sell. The lower the price, the volume actually increases. But that's not a linear curve, as you can tell. It's kinked. And there's an area which we call the monopolistic area, where you can increase the price, but the volume doesn't decrease proportionally. So basically, you can increase price without actually selling significantly less. And the optimal point is P1, where suddenly humans again start to react elastically. And that inelastic zone, where humans don't care about the price increase, that's the monopolistic area companies want to maximize. And you cannot do this with homo economicus, which the classical theories are teaching you. We are homo sapiens. And homo sapiens have rational boundaries, they have emotions, they have geographic boundaries, they have less data. This is the difference between rational, objective truth and the reality we live in. Yeah, I could talk so much about these things, which I don't want to do now, because I want to also summarize what's really important. And that's what I believe is what everybody's looking for, right? Some kind of success. So I've defined my success differently. I said I wanted, 
I want to cure an incurable disease. And the, my means to an end is money. The money cannot be my target. So, and I, when I have too much time on my hand, I ask questions like, what is life? Is life just geochemistry becoming biochemistry? Is it just a rare configuration of atoms? I say, what if I was the last human on Earth? I ask myself, well, what is Saigon, the last human on Earth? You wake up, nobody's there. What would I do? I said, I would probably start reading books, educate myself, maybe I could save humanity, even if there's no women, maybe there's a way to kind of create another one. <laughs> I'll try. I would be there for you guys, I'll try. I also said, would I actually randomly just kill hu animals and not eat them? No. I would actually become friends with those animals. I would be feeling lonely, right? So I would talk to my cats, which I do today already, but that's what I would do. I would be animal friendly. I would only kill if I really had to. And then in terms of nature, I would actually not really harm nature. Because I need that world, right? If, if that turns into lava, then the planet is going to be fine. We're going to be screwed. Well, me, the only one. So I would actually even protect nature. So, and I said, well, why do I actually have to do that only when I realize I'm the last human on Earth? We should do that today. Those are the important things in life, right? So, you know, be kind to animals. Educate yourself and then protect nature. But these thought experiments actually get you there. So then I said, success in capitalism, what we are actually building with businesses, is worth nothing without the combination of morality. So I said, what's the language of morality? It's love, right? What's the language of capitalism? It's mathematics. So as an entrepreneur, you have to be able to speak both languages for a fulfilling life. Because at the end, there's three systems. One was the capitalist system. Building businesses, profit maximization, long term, the realization of your shareholder value. But that only solves a piece of the puzzle. Because there are certain systems which solve other problems, which capitalism cannot solve. Capitalism without legal boundaries is worthless. So there's government systems. Government systems solve problems such as military court systems, which capitalist companies should not go into. And the third system is the non-profit sector. Because the non-profit sector solves problems businesses don't want to solve. I see this myself. Rare diseases, for example. I, I invested into a biotech company, and I said, okay, can we solve my problem? He said, your problem is a rare disease. There's no money in it. So if we didn't have that system, we wouldn't solve rare diseases. Capitalism without morality doesn't work. So at the end of the day, nobody will ask you what you've bought, but what you've lived. Thank you very much, guys. If there's any questions, please feel free to ask. Um, who is actually leading this here? Is, oh, I see somebody there. I was just wondering, how is your sister doing? I was just wondering, how is your sister doing? So you, you said at the beginning that that was 
one of your main driving forces that led you to, um, yeah, to walk forward, right? That was your mountain where you wanted to walk up. So were you able to influence her life in a positive manner that you wanted to? Uh, thank you very much for asking. I appreciate that. Um, <clears throat> so my sister has uh, a rare disease, which was told as being incurable, which was not something I wanted to accept, right? As an entrepreneur, I say, if there's a problem, we'll fix it. And she has three um, areas. One, She's 28 years old, but mentally she's probably six, seven. So that's the uh, cognitive disability. Then there is uh, seizures in terms of epilepsy, which when she was a child was up to 100 times a day in terms of um, kind of getting into small second seizures, and then the grand miles, which are actually the large seizures. And the third one is the side effects of the medicine she's taking. So five years ago, uh, I went out on a journey. I said, how can I fix this? I'm not a doctor, right? I'm not a scientist. So long story short, I found the best scientists in the world. We recognized that she was on the wrong medication. We actually even identified what she really had, because epilepsy, there's hundreds of types. So since five years, she's seizure free. She has no seizures, pretty much. The side effects of her medicine stopped. And the third battle I still have is making her learn again. That's what I'm still fighting for. Yes, please. Thank you so much. <laughs> that was persuasive. <laughs> you see? <laughs> so there's many ways. I mean, as I said, our brain has an affinity for stories, hardwired. If it's true or not, we love stories. So it depends on who you want to persuade. I can give you an example which might be very much in the uh, business field. If you want to persuade investors, you have to tell an evidence-based story. And as I said, evidence doesn't necessarily have to be based on objective truth, but it could be any of those three. One of the reasons why there's business models which are hyped and they never turn profitable is if, you, if an investor would just say, objectively looking at this, how are you making money? But if it's excessively re repeated that this business model is really good and there's a great story and the person who's telling you this, you really trust because you like that person. And that's what even thousands of years ago, Plato and Aristotle said, you have to appeal to the tripartite soul. Ethos, pathos, logos. When you see a doctor, telling you that this toothpaste is good because he's wearing a uniform and this thing, this device, you trust. So you can work on all those three areas and you can sell to the 95% of the brain. That's in a nutshell. 